بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعظان الأنصار اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزاء نعود لك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله we have توفيق to continue our study of 40 hadith and we have also been blessed to witness month of شعبان so maybe for some of you or all of you month of شعبان has started we are hopeful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven our sins in the months of Rajab and shortcomings and blessed us with many inshallah good things. But now that we enter month of Sha'ban, our hope is renewed and we should also refresh ourselves and get inshallah the most out of this very blessed month of Sha'ban inshallah. The hadith number 13 is on tawakkul, trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Shaykh al Kulaini narrates from some of our Shia masters of hadith, Iddatin min ashabina. عن أحمد بن محمد بن خالد عن غير واحد أحمد بن محمد بن خالد through several people quotes from Ali ibn Asbad and Ahmad ibn Umar al-Hallal عن Ali ibn Suwaid عن أبي الحسن الأول when in our hadith it is said Abu al-Hasan without adding anything or Abu al-Hasan al-Awwal it refers to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam if it is said Abu al-Hasan al-Thani it refers to Imam Raza alayhi salam and Abu al-Hasan al-Thalith Imam Hadi alayhi salam so whether it is just Abu al-Hasan or it is Abu al-Hasan al-Awwal refers to Imam Qadim alayhi salam. For Amir al-Mumuni alayhi salam, normally uh, in the hadith, they don't say an Abi al-Hasan. They say Amir al-Mumuni and Ali alayhi salam and Amir al-Mumuni. So when it is said just Abu al-Hasan, it's Imam Qadim. Plus those who are familiar with the narrators of hadith and their generation and, you know, we call tabaqat al-rajal, they know that Ali ibn suwaid cannot narrate directly from Imam Ali alayhi salam. It is Imam Qadim alayhi salam. So, Ali ibn Suwaid says, سَأَلْتُ أَنْ قَوْلِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ بَجَلْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَا حَسْبُهُ I ask Imam Qadim alayhi salam about Allah's word. In Surah Talaq, verse 3, part of the ayah is وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ This is part of a phrase that is very uh, beautiful and very good to remember and repeat. مَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ إن الله بالغ أمره قد جعل الله لكل شيء قدرا. Also we have من يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب before this. So he says I asked Imam Ali Salam about this ayah. His question was focused on this part. ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه. 
whoever puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is sufficient. What does this mean? Could you elaborate more on this important message of the Quran? Faqala. Imam Kazim alayhi salam said, At-tawakkulu ala Allahi darajatun. Tawakkul has different degrees, different stages, different levels. Minha, one of the levels, which is not the lowest one, but maybe also not the highest one. One of the high ones, but not perhaps the highest. And tatawakkal ala Allah fi umurika kulliha. To put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all your affairs. Not in some affairs only. Sometimes we think that maybe for only difficult things or uh, extraordinary things or things which are not possible in ordinary way, we ask Allah for help. For example, if someone has cancer and it is a kind of late stage, the chance of treatment is very low or zero, then they think they should trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if it is simple illness, they can put their trust in doctor and medicine. No, this is not right. We should put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether the illness is very small or very difficult. Whether there is good treatment and medicine or not. And tatawakkala ala Allah fi umurika kullaha. In all your affairs, you must put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even just waking up, just drinking, eating, breathing, walking, everything, we need to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him to help us. Then, فَمَا فَعَلَ بِكْ كُنْتَ عَنْهُ رَاضِيًا Then after that, whatever he does with you, you should be pleased. If there is a good doctor, very experienced, very qualified, you trust him, and then listen to what he does. And if he makes a decision, gives you certain prescription, you should be pleased with that. Otherwise, why did you trust him? If you trust him, you don't question him, you don't challenge him. You would be pleased with his decision. If you are not sure whether this is a good doctor or not, okay, inquire. If you are not sure he is sincere or not, he is, you know, kind or not, he is concerned about your health or not, he is just after money or he is really interested in your treatment, okay, makes, uh, you should make any inquiry. But when you reach the point that you trust him and put your trust in him, then listen to what he says and please be pleased with that. Maybe he says you should take medicine now. Maybe he says now you should not take medicine. Just have diet, a special diet. Maybe he says you should go for surgery. Maybe he says you shouldn't go for surgery. If we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge and power and love for us, if we believe in his wisdom, and then we put our trust in him, we should later be also pleased with whatever he decides for us. Maybe he gives us what we want soon. Maybe he gives us what we want late. Maybe he doesn't give us what, he want, what we want because it doesn't suit us or doesn't suit everybody in general. But for sure, he would make sure that the best possible thing happens for us. 
in the long term. That is no doubt about it. So, Imam says, فَمَا فَعَلَ بِكَ كُنْتَ عَنْهُ رَاضِيًا Whatever he does with you, you would be pleased with. تَعْلَمُ This is very, very important. And I think most of us maybe have problem in this part. تَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ لَا يَأْلُوكَ خَيْرًا وَفَضْلًا and you should know that Allah would not reserve any good, any grace and withhold from you. Would not do taqseer, would not have shortcoming in giving you the best, His grace. This is very important part because I think Although we know Allah is very knowledgeable, powerful, and kind, and merciful, but sometimes we think that He is like maybe a king, that even if He has power and knowledge and love, suppose you have a very good, just, nice king, very powerful, very established, very rich, He has millions of people to look after and he has helpers and aides and there is hierarchy. How he knows about me? He has so many things on his plate. Or maybe, for example, you have a grandfather who has lots of children and grandchildren. He is very kind, very nice, very much loving you. But say, my grandfather has so many people under his care he may not even remember me he may not even you know think about me or his attention would be divided into tens of people I would receive only little of his attention I think many of us think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way but the reality is that this is totally wrong each person should think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a king who has very rich treasure, very great country, lots of soldiers and helpers who work for him, but he has only one person under his care. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if the whole system in a country under a very kind and just and wise king has only one person to look after. How much attention they would give you? How much support they give you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his servants is like this. You may remember uh, in the past, I have mentioned this hadith in some lectures, I don't know exactly when and where, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, you have treated me as you have many other lords. You don't have any other lord, but you treat me as you have as if you have many other lords. You never give your 100% attention to me. You never give your 100% loyalty and love to me. You try, even if you are nice people, this is my explanation. Even if you are nice people, you try to keep me pleased, but also please many other people, do many other things. But I treat you as if I have no other servant, even if I have billions. This is not fair. Maybe this is a hadith of Qudsi. I heard it from one of ulama. 
I have not yet myself checked a, a reference. But it's very true. Certain things uh, don't need reference. It's a reality. That we treat him as if we have many other lords, and he treats us as if he has no other servant. He is for everyone wholeheartedly, as a whole, without any divided attention. So, if this is the case, you must know that for people who put their trust in him, he would not then fail to do his best. Maybe you say, I put my trust in him, but maybe he doesn't accept to be my wakil. You know, maybe there are people, for example, there is a person that I know, he is very good in buying cars. I tell him, you know, please buy a car for me, but he says, I am busy. There is someone who is very good in buying houses. I say, I want to trust you. He says, no, don't trust me. I don't have time. Maybe we want to trust Allah, but He has no special concern for us. The answer is, no, He has Himself invited you to trust Him. He Himself says that you should you should put your trust in him. When it says, Man ala Allah fa huwa hasbuh, What does it mean? It means that he is offering this. So, if he offers to put your trust in him, and he has all the requirements, and his attention is not divided, his love is not limited, his care is not you know, limited, restricted, so, whatever then, he decides for you, you would be pleased and you know that la ya'luka khayran wa fadla. It's impossible that he would not take care of your interest 100%. But he takes care of your interest according to his knowledge, according to his wisdom, not according to your knowledge. Not according to your limited understanding, not according to your, you know, expectations. And you know that the judgment for the rule is with him. He judges or he makes the decision and runs the decision. So trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by dedicating your affair to Him. And then in this affair and other affairs, in everything, rely on Him, trust Him. So this is the meaning of tawakkul, the power of tawakkul. And what a mutawakkil is expected to do. After mentioning the hadith, then Imam Khomeini starts talking about the concept of tawakkul and different meanings and degrees for tawakkul. So the first chapter is about meanings of tawakkul and its ranks he says different definitions or descriptions have been offered for example hajimullah abdullah ansari in manazil sairin stations of the pharaohs he says at tawakkulu kelatul amra kullihi 
و تعویل على وکالته توکل ایز تو سابمیت تو دلیگیت اول افرز تو دیر اونر the one who is in charge of them and to rely on his agency so you submit all your efforts to Allah and trust him rely on him some mystics some orafa have said at-tawakkulu tarhul badan fil ubudiyya wa ta'alluq al-qalb bil-rububiyya they said tawakkul is to throw your body in servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to belong with your heart to the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your body is busy with worshipping and serving and your heart belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically you are using and utilizing all physical power in serving him and then you don't do anything except according to his will and delicate your affairs to him some have said at tawakkulu ala allah in qita'ul abd fi jami' ma ya'muluhu min al makhlukin some have said that tawakkul ala allah means putting your trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that you disconnect completely all your dreams from people from creatures of Allah don't tie your dreams to people don't expect from people to help you achieve your dreams okay then Imam Khomeini says these are different definitions which are very also close to each other and we don't need to go that much into details about these definitions and say you know what are the merit advantages disadvantages of each in general the concept of tawakkul is important uh, sorry is known to us and this is the main thing that we know what is generally the concept of tawakkul what we need to discuss here is to talk about different levels and degrees of tawakkul this by itself clarifies the concept also more then he says in order to understand different degrees of tawakkul we should know different degrees of servants of allah in their knowledge about his lordship different degrees of servants of Allah in their knowledge means different degrees of their knowledge about Allah and then he enters into this discussion I think we uh, stop here and inshallah we continue next week we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include us among the people who put their trust in him in every affairs of their life Inshallah, if we see and experience the power of tawakkul, then the first choice, the most natural choice always for us would be to begin with Allah and to end with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to be distracted by physical, ordinary causes. الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على اشهد ان لا اله الا الله